Good morning, first service. Morning. Welcome to camp meeting. How's your energy today? <laughs> Put you in the middle, Mr. President. I want to make sure the Mr. President's in the I middle. You know, I just feel so much road. better. <laughs> That's right. Well, it is good to see you today. Camp meeting is such a fun place to be, fun place to recoup and, and recoup and get in God's word. Is that what you're doing today? Amen. I was at early morning, early morning prayer service today. Some of you were there, that's right. We had a great time with Pastor Nugent opening the Word, singing some songs together. And then we got a high-powered uh, infusion of grace and goodness from, from our uh, Minister or Vice President, Orlando Lopez. He's going to be there tomorrow morning as well. I want to invite you to do that. But it's a pleasure to be with the President today and our Treasurer, Elisa. Thank you. Hey, Lisa, what, what is it that you like about camp meeting? Oh, so much, but I'll summarize. I love being here at this location in nature, and then I love interacting and fellowshipping with all of those that come and join and just spending time in God's Word. What about you? What is it that you don't like about what camp meeting? What do I meeting? do not like about camp? Well, actually, there are a few things I don't like about camp meeting. One of them is I don't get enough opportunity to spend time over at a better choice. You know, the bookstore, our, our general store. <laughs> Anybody get in there yet? Yesterday? A few right. hands. It's going to be open. I, is, is it open tomorrow night? I don't, it, it, tonight, tonight, yes. And so tomorrow? Yes. That's going to be awesome. I love going there because they have great books, great resources, and a few snacks, too. That's not a bad idea. But, you know, there's another thing I don't like about camp meeting. It's too short. How many of you are old school that used to get together for a week or more, huh? <laughs> Look at that, Mr. President. We got to pray about this somehow. We're not sure how to figure it out, but oh, we would set the tents up, and this was in Pennsylvania Conference. We'd set the tents up, and we would bring our a whole suitcase full of clothes and camping gear, and we would camp out for at least a week. You know, it's great to be together as God's people. Worshiping together, praying together, nurturing each other, seeing people we haven't seen for a year or more. But anyway, welcome to camp meeting, Mr. President. The thing I don't like about camp meeting is not having camp meeting. <laughs> for the last two years, we couldn't. Mm. And as we were um, thinking about this year, of course, camp meeting is organized even the, the year before. We need to find the speaker. We need to organize everything. So the, the, the committee that puts all of this together, we were thinking, are we going to have camp meeting in 2022, this year? As you know, 2020, we had to cancel, totally canceled. The churches were closed. Everything was shut down. Then last year we did something uh, virtual or virtually camp meeting, and uh, it was beautiful. Derek Morris was with us. I don't know how many of you connected. But we decided, in faith, we decided we're going to move forward, and this year we're going to have camp meeting in Kulakwa in person. Are you happy for that? <laughs> we are so happy that we are here again after two years. So praise the Lord for that. Enjoy uh, the time that the Lord has given to us to be here together. I tell you something. The world is living, it's going through uh, a times of crisis. And I, I don't know if you would agree with me, but we don't know if we're going to be here next year. So let us enjoy this time. Let us enjoy committing this year. This is the time that we have. So let us um, let us um, enjoy it and be happy for what the Lord has um, given us this year, 2020. I want to introduce a speaker. You have his short bio here in your, in your program. It's a summary of all the things that Pastor Bird, Dr. Bird, has done over 20 years in ministry. But um, I'll give you a few highlights. He is presently serving as the pre, uh, president of the Southwest Region Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, he's been in ministry for 27 years. Now, as I was reading this, something caught my attention. 
It says that Dr. Bird has been involved or baptized more than 22,000 souls. Is that beautiful? I, I said that last night and I, I said it with a lot of reverence because that's a big deal. Um, he used to be the lead pastor, the senior pastor at Oakwood University Church. And uh, you can read about the awards and achievements and um, recognitions that he has received over the years. And um, it is a pleasure, it is a blessing to have Dr. Bird with us this weekend. I'll finish with this. Dr. Bird is married, He's been married for 24 years, and he has three daughters, uh, and he was talking about his daughters last night. How many of you were not here last night? Let me see your hand. So you're coming from the community to spend the day. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and being here early for this early service. God bless you. Enjoy Can Meeting 2022 and let us continue pressing on, which is the theme of our Can Meeting this year. Press on. God let's, bless you. Let's have a word of prayer as yes. we close this segment. Your kind and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, as we begin our first service here this morning, we just thank you for your presence that never leaves. We acknowledge that you are with us, Lord, and we just ask that you will continue to abide with us, be with each person that is seated here, that is on their way, that is watching their Lord. May we feel your Holy Spirit in our lives through this service, through every aspect of this service, Lord. Bless the speaker, Lord, we pray as well. In Jesus' name, amen. My eyes need a, um, because they didn't get to the light. Yeah. It's, the light is bright. Yeah. <clears throat> God has worked throughout my life all <laughs> since I was born. But um, especially these last uh, two years during the pandemic, I felt like he has prepared me um, for this. I've been sick for the majority of my life in and out of the hospital. And um, I feel like the health message and uh, people were coming to our family, you know, for advice uh, when they got sick. And I, I just felt like it was such a blessing because we could show God through, you know, his words you know his advice when he showed me that everything i do matters in the simplest things i can change someone's life i feel these, uh, as if these last two years god has very has been very accompanying our family just because um, my family throughout it all um we have had health you know financials uh, part we're still working so i believe god has really blessed my family um in that sense uh, he helps me overcome my fears when I don't want to do something. He helps me through it. Every time there's a situation, I turn to God. I see how important God is because I depend on God for everything. And I pray to him all the time that everyone should give God a chance in their life. Honestly, um, I came from a, a, a country that was very poor. And um, the possibilities here, I guess, are just way wider than they are over there. So I think that without um, that relationship that my family has taught us and passed on through generations, um, I guess without that, we, it's incredible to think that we're, we made it this far and that we have as many opportunities as we do now. So I would say something like that. So I know the Lord is always working in my life and always working in Frank's life, my husband. We do prison ministry, so we see miracles every day. It just reminds me to stay consistent in everything. If I'm not talking to him every day, if I'm not communing with him, I find myself uh, slipping and falling to temptations. So, staying true to his word. Well, especially in the last, I will believe it's about three years, I think I've been on a new journey with the Lord, um, learning about His love. Um, sometimes you pray for patience in your life and then He gives you uh, struggles and He gives you problems so that you will learn to be patient and with people. 
I want to be able to, when people see me, that they will see his love in me because he was like a magnet. So that's what I'm praying for. But it has been very difficult in some situations, but I'm not giving up. I'm going to continue to press on. Press on? I don't know. Like go, go like, go into it? Like push through? I don't know. Well, I will press on because I know that God is with me. Just, just try God, you know. Um, most of the time we pray for things, most of the time we want things. It's easy to get discouraged, but I feel like if we can just um, ask God faithfully, truthfully, you know, just be transparent and genuine, I feel like those are the, um, the core qualities that we should have, right? Reflecting Him on everything that I do in my life will be my best way to press on. Just talk to Him and say, God, I need you. Uh, I want to be closer to you. Um, show up in my life. It means to not get discouraged, to keep on, to have faith and to keep praying for that faith because that faith, He gives it to us every day. And faith is courage to go on no matter what you're going through, to rise above every storm. Um, for me, I would say um, discipline and just consistency like when you want to maintain any relationship or anything you do, really. Press on is to uh, never give up. Keep moving. <laughs> uh, I said this word before, and for me, it's resilience. It's resilience. Going, you know, going through thick and thin, pressing on, progressing. That, that, that all, uh, to me, is a, a, a very uh, similar word or similar aspect that I, that I, that I think of when we talk about pressing on. Keep going. Don't give up and just go with the flow. <laughs> Press on. 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 How many of you know that the Bible promises that God is enthroned on the praises of his people? When we worship, God shows up. Amen. So we're going to praise a God who is a way maker, who is the doer of the impossible. Let's praise him together. Miracle work, promise. 
Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Pathfinder and Adventurer Department of Florida Conference, we'd like to take this time to recognize two individuals who just served Pathfinders and Adventurers in Florida Conference in a remarkable way for some 30, 20 years plus. We have Carol Barnett and Ray Saladino. Would you put your hands together for them? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so, first of all, Carol has served our Florida Conference in various uh, capacities, Florida Conference Pathfinders and Adventurers, as a uh, volunteer. Uh, you are an area administrator for the North. You are a cluster coordinator. Um, you are many other things, but also you are the missions coordinator for Pathfinders and Adventurers. What was that all about? Well, I would uh, plan mission trips, and we would go on them all, all over the world, and locally, and out of state. We just had a great time. Planning mission trips for our young people. Isn't that wonderful? What was your favorite experience? My favorite is doing vacation Bible school with, the, um, with our Pathfinders for the kids within the communities of where we went. Wow, that's awesome, that's awesome. And then Ray Saladino, I think some pictures were on the screen, I'm not sure, but Ray Saladino, you had an interesting ministry. You were part of what we call the Island Navigator Ministry. And we're not talking about nav navigating Hawaii or anything like that, are we? Mm -mm, no. All right, so what was that all about? Just taking young people in the Florida Keys out to an island to teach them about God's nature. That most young people that are in the cities don't have an opportunity to see. So we took them to the reef, we taught them uh, marine algae, marine invertebrates, taught them about the fish, just marine life in the Florida Keys that young people don't have an opportunity to see. And it was my backyard, that's where I lived all my life. Wow, So wow. I'd share with them. Now Ray, let me ask you something. How did that ministry affect your life? Well, it affected me in a big time. In 1985, I was going through a, a hard time in my life and some, um, some leaders from Central Florida came camping. They got a hold of me. I wasn't in the church. I was an Adventist, but I wasn't practicing and working on the Sabbath. And, and that started a whole change in my life, was working with the young people and the Pathfinders and got back into church, rebaptized, and yeah. Amen. It was awesome. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So on behalf of Pedro Perez, our Pathfinder and Adventurer Director, who could not be here today, and our Florida Conference Administration, we'd like to present you with these two small tokens, small tokens of our appreciation sure. for your many years of dedicated service, for pressing on, for pressing on through hard times, for pressing on to be a blessing to the young people of this conference and their families. Would you put your hands together right. one more time for them? Thank you so much. This is 
beautiful representation of what happens right here on Camp Kalakwa for summer camp. I have with me this morning Teresa Stride, our summer camp director, and you've met Phil Yance. For those of you that were here last night, our camp director. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So they have been sharing the beautiful things that have happening, been happening here during our summer camp experience. And so Teresa, tell us a little bit about some of your experiences. Yes, one of our experiences uh, last summer was we had a camper come to camp and he was in foster care. I worked with DCF to bring him here through our worthy camper scholarship. Uh, he could not afford to come on his own. And so he came to summer camp and he got to be a kid for that week. And he was one of the happiest kids I was sharing. He was only nine years old. And he was this beautiful, happy, just uh, jubilant little boy. And I can, still, I can see his face, I can see his smile, smiling at me at the cafeteria. Um, and then on Thursday night, we have these prayer cards that we hand out. And he wrote his prayer request down. And it said, pray for my mom. Uh, he was pulled from his home because of his mom's poor choices. And so on his prayer card, his prayer was for his mom. And that's all I knew. And I just happened to look at it. I happened to get it, right? Just like God does in his beautiful way. And I saw his name. And so I prayed for him by name and for his mom. And then on Sabbath, I went down to the spring where we do our baptisms. And I saw him there. And I said, hey, let's call him Matthew. I said, hey, Matthew, what are you doing? And he said, Miss Teresa, I'm going to get baptized today. And I said, no way. I said, oh, I'm so happy for you, Matthew. I'm so happy for you to be in the family of Jesus with us. And he said, yeah. He said, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going after camp. I don't know where my home is going to be. He said, but I know that I want Jesus to come with me. I got through the story without crying. <laughs> and I said, wow, God, wow, you are good. Amen. Worthy Camper Scholarships, our offering for today, for this weekend, goes for, stu for kids like Matthew that would not be able to come, would not be able to hear about Jesus, would not be able to learn about praying for the challenges in their young lives. And so what you can do will help for that. Um, you see on the screen there's a text number to give. And there are other options as well. There's a give.floridaconference.com website 
that has an option, the Adventist giving option, the PayPal option. Um, but what you can do and are willing to do will help kids like Matthew to be able to experience Jesus. Mm-hmm. Teresa, you have one more thing to tell us as our family, our brothers and sisters, silently prays about what God would have them to give. Yes. Another thing that I was sharing was in 21, we had the highest number of applicants for Worthy Camper Scholarship. And we take that seriously. We look at them, we pray over them. And these blessings of, of the financial uh, giving just helps these kids come to camp. So we had the highest number in 21, which left our funds very depleted coming into 22. And we've had quite a few applicants again this year. And so I remember it was a Monday morning and uh, Stacy came in and she said, Teresa, our funds, I don't have anything left and I have all these applicants on my desk. What do we do? And I said, we're going to pray. We're going to pray over these guys. God will see us through. That's what I said. And that just happened to be a day that Phil was at the Florida conference with our administration. And the next day, that's what we did. We prayed. The next day, Phil comes in. He said, Teresa, just like that. Teresa, you did. (laughs) And he said, guess what? He said, the conference just named Worthy Camper Scholarship as the the donations uh, special offering from camp meeting. It's beautiful. God is good. God is good. Amen. And so what you will do today and this evening will go towards replenishing the Worthy Camper Fund. We have our assistants, our ushers, our deacons here to also collect. So I invite you to stand and start collecting. And actually, let me have a word of prayer, and then you can continue collecting, and we will have some special music. Let's pray together. Dear kind and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, you know the experiences of these children that come to camp, and and those that would not be able to come and and learn about you, Father. And and you have asked us all to do what we can to help draw others to you. So, Father, we just ask for your blessing on each person here as we think about, as we pray about what we can do to make an impact on the lives of children all around us, their Father. Whether it's a dollar, whether it's a ten, whether it's a hundred, whatever you place on our hearts, dear Father. We just bless each person here in your name, Father, knowing that with everything, it's done well once it's done in your name, dear Father. Lord, we just ask that you will guide and keep us, Lord. Bless us, protect us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. shall not be the arrow by day, nor shall I fear the terror now. Oh, God. 
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let's try that again. I said, Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is good to be here this morning, this bright, blessed Sabbath morning right here at Camp Kalakwa for Florida Conference Camp Meeting. What a joy it is for me. I know that some of you may think, oh, what a joy it is for us. No, what a joy it is for me to be here and see your smiling faces. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you're happy and you know it, come on, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Dr. Machado, thank you very, very much. I appreciate you, Pastor Goff, Sister Raming, and the entire team here at Florida Conference. Let me tell you, 
I had a good night's rest last night. Woke up this morning, they had good breakfast for me. Come on, say amen. I'm not talking about just a little cereal here or there. I'm talking about good breakfast. When is Cammie next week and the next week and the next week? I'll keep coming back for that. Praise God, but thank you so much for your warmth and your hospitality. It's good to be here this morning. I'm ready to get in the Word of God. What a joy, what a joy to see you as I've shared earlier. But now let's hear a word from the Lord. Please stand with me and take your Bibles and let's go to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, and we're going to read this text together. Coming from the King James Version of the Bible, Numbers chapter 13. I'm being mindful of my time because I know we have to have a second service but if the Holy Spirit gets good, Doc, we're going to have to just, pa we're gonna have to just pause a little later and come back when we're ready. But I'm going to try to stick to the time. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. If you have it, let me hear you say amen. All right. We're going to begin reading verse number 30. The word of God says, and Caleb stilled the people before whom, everybody? Moses. And said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. Verse 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Father, for the next couple of moments, tabernacle with us by the power of your Holy Spirit in this physical space as well as to those over the airwaves in the digital space. We be careful to praise you for what you're going to do this day in this service. Hide behind the cross of Jesus, because it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In harmony with our theme last night, we talked about Fear Not, Isaiah 41.10. Uh, today we continue with that. Philippians 3, forgetting those things which are behind me, I'm reaching to those things which are before me. I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. This morning we challenge you with let's go forward as we now talk about pressing on. Let's go forward. Let's go what everybody? Come on, talk to me. Let's go what everybody? Forward. Israel has just experienced in the text the great escape. After living 400 years of captivity in Egypt, God has rescued his people and now they're on a journey to the promised land. They had witnessed the mighty hand of God defeat the most powerful army on the face of the globe. They had been slaves one day, but they were free the next day. They had seen God release frogs and flies and lice to fight mean old Pharaoh. They had seen God make a Red Sea a dry highway. They had seen Pharaoh and 600 of his chosen chariots get drowned in the Red Sea. The Bible says it was so powerful that when Miriam looked back and saw the man who had oppressed them, the man who had raped their women, the man who had beaten their sons. The Bible says she grabbed a tambourine and she started pr playing it and started praising God. And God said, the enemies that you see today, you shall see them no more. They had seen God take the bitter waters of the Meraba into cool, calm waters from which they could now drink. They had seen God heal through a brazen serpent that all they had to do was look at it and they were healed from their diseases. Which is why the emblem today for medicine still has the serpent around the rod commemorating that all healing comes from God. Do I have a witness in this place? They had seen God rain down manna from heaven. 
But not only that, their clothes never wore out. Even as they marched and walked through the wilderness, the tension and friction of their marching never ate through their clothes. In fact, they had seen God, in my opinion, set up a dry cleaners in the desert. They had a dry cleaners. You say, well, Dr. Bird, how did they have a dry cleaners? Well, there's no way you could be around people for 40 years every day with limited water and the same clothes on, smelling good and looking good, unless God was providing for you. Somebody knows what I'm talking about because after all the things you've been through, God still has you looking good. God still has you smelling good. And folk don't even know what you're going through. I mean, sometimes you can be broke, not have a dollar to your name. You've got one suit on, but you just put on a different shirt and tie. Do I have a witness in this place? Somebody will come up to you and say, is that a new suit? You just smile. You can't lie, but you say, God just takes care of me. Uh, Is that a new dress? Well, yes, that's a new dress. Is that a new hairstyle? Yes. Well, how is that a new hairstyle? Well, I just flip it this way today and flip it the other way the next day. It's a new hairstyle. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God will keep you looking good and folk won't even know what you're going through. God kept their shoes from wearing out. 40 years of walking and their shoes still look good. Somebody knows you can serve a God and we serve a God. Who can keep old stuff working for you? God was so careful, unfriends of mine, for his people, that as they walked for 40 years, not one of the thousands of people walking, the Bible records, not one of them had their feet swell. As they walked through the wilderness, that's how God was careful for Israel. God had freed the Israelites from slavery to Egypt and then led them to the borders of the Canaan promised land. But when they get to the brink, of the promised land. God commands to Moses to tell the people, tell us if the promised land is everything God said it would be. But before they give an answer, they have to form a committee. Now tell the truth. (laughs) Shame the devil. (laughs) That's how we are. For any decision we have to make as a church, we have to form a committee. (laughs) Somebody said the 11th commandment is, thou shalt form a committee. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when God says, tell us about the promised land, a committee is made up of 12 people with one person representing each of Israel's 12 tribes. So Moses tells the committee, go spy out the land, observe the people, observe their cities, find out what the land is like, find out if they're strong or if they're weak, find out if they're walled or fortified cities, find out if the soil is fertile or if it's poor, find out if they have trees or not, And if they have trees, tell me if there are fruit on those trees or not. And when you're finished, come back and give me a report. The Bible says in Numbers 13, 26, that the 12 committee members spent 40 days spying out the land. And then they now came back to Brother Moses to tell him their report. They said the land flowed with milk and honey. They said the land was fertile. They said that there was a cluster of grapes so big that it took at least two men to carry the cluster on a large pole. They said the land was what God said it was. The first part of their report was positive. But then all of a sudden, something changed. The report changed. The report was no longer positive. The report was no longer unanimous. The committee is now divided 10 to 2. One committee, but two different reports. The majority of the committee says there are giants in the land. The minority says, but if God be for us, who can be against us? The majority says we can't do it. But the minority says we can do it. The majority saw defeat. But the minority saw victory. One report says go. The other report says no. 
It's amazing to me how the same group of people can look at the same thing, but yet come out with different interpretations. The sermon was good to me. Well, the sermon did nothing for me. The music was a blessing to me. The music didn't do a thing for me. I like that suit. I can't stand that suit. Looking at the same thing, but different interpretations. People can look at the same data, be confronted with the same facts, experience the same events, and draw totally different conclusions. Why do people have different reactions to the same reality? It's probably because we see things not as they are, but we see things as we are. The majority is motivated by sight rather than faith. But somebody knows we walk by faith and not by sight. When you have faith in God, you have to move beyond what you see and realize what God sees, what you don't see. Too often the people of God, we can't move forward because we have no vision. And the Bible says where there is no vision, the people, what everybody? They perish. I like the great author, the great activist of the state of Alabama, Helen Keller, who was born blind. She was asked one day, what could be worse than being born blind? She said, having sight with no vision. In the name of Jesus, I dare somebody today, quit letting blind people proofread your vision. I wish I had a witness in this place. But Caleb and Joshua, praise God for the minority. Praise God for Caleb. Praise God for Joshua. Caleb tells the people, hush up with all that talk. Let's go up at once and take possession of the land, for we are well able to overcome it. How did Caleb know that they could overcome giants in the land? Caleb knew that they were able to do it, not so much because they were able, but Caleb knew they could do it because God is able. Now let me put a kickstand right there for a moment. I hear people say all the time, God is able. God is able. We serve an able God. But you know what? I believe many people don't really believe that because we would spend less time getting folks straight and telling people off if we really believe God was able. We'd spend less time worrying and staying up all night if we really believe God is able. Let me tell you something in the name of Jesus this morning. God is able. I don't care what you're going through. I do believe that God is able. Cancer, God is able. Coronavirus, God is able. Diabetes, God is able. Unemployed, God is able. Death of a loved one, God is able. Marriage in trouble, God is able. Lonely and by yourself, God is able. A strung out son, God is able. A wayward daughter, God is able. A habit you can't break, God is able. Sin you can't shake, God is able. Trouble you can't take, God is able. Because I serve a God who's able to do exceeding, abundantly, and above all, we could ever ask or think. Caleb knew it. Joshua knew it. But the majority of the committee disagreed with Caleb and Joshua. So what did they say in verse 31? We're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Now they're talking about themselves. Verse 32, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we are in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, you would think that out of all God had done for the children of Israel, that they would have had more faith than that. That he had opened the Red Sea for them. He had closed those same waters on the Egyptians. He had given them water in the desert when they were thirsty. He had given them food in the desert when they were hungry. And now they have amnesia about what God had done for them. But let's not be too hard on the Israelites. Because we don't live in a glass house either. After all God has done for some of us. Some of us will doubt the power of God. We see the enemies of God as giants, and we see ourselves as grasshoppers. 
The majority of the committee members were defeated before they even got started because they embraced grasshopper mentality. You see, their grasshopper mentality was rooted in their Egyptian bondage. It's one thing to be delivered out of Egypt, but it's another thing to get the Egypt out of you. They're still dealing with grasshopper mentality because of what they remember in Egypt. Pharaoh told them when. Pharaoh told them where. Pharaoh told them how. Pharaoh represents a system, a system that controls and a system that manipulates. And if you've been in bondage to this system, it creates a mindset that becomes institutionalized to the system. And before long, you begin to think that you can never be anything, you can never do anything, you will never amount to anything because Pharaoh has you thinking like a grasshopper. Remember, they called themselves grasshoppers. The people, the others, the enemy didn't call them grasshoppers. And when you act like a grasshopper, in your own eyes, you will be seen as a grasshopper in other people's eyes because people treat you how you let them. But when you realize who you are and you realize whose you are, then you will seek deliverance from a grasshopper mentality that ties you to stop experiencing the thing that God has purposed for your life. You see, grasshopper mentality is fearful. Grasshopper mentality is small-mindedness. Grasshopper mentality is myopic thinking. Grasshopper mentality relies on excuses. Somebody's not getting this, so let me try it this way. Let me, let me break this down, what grasshopper mentality is. Grasshopper mentality says, go buy a car. Put, like the young people say, some rims on it. Put some 40s on it. Put some spinners on it. But live with your mama. <laughs> Don't pay her rents. Live off your mama. Grasshopper. Grasshopper mentality says you want a new TV. You need a new TV. But because you can't afford to buy a new TV, you go to a rent -a center and pay $25 a month for 25 years, and by the time you finish, you would have bought five televisions. Grasshopper, are you hearing what I'm saying? But let's bring it to the church. Grasshopper mentality says people won't accept the gospel. The world is too secular. We can't evangelize. We can't baptize new people. We'll never grow. We don't have enough money. Our doctrine is too hard. Our message is too hard. People don't want to hear about the seventh day Sabbath grasshopper. But in the name of Jesus, I'm tired of grasshopper mentality. I'm tired of negative folk. I'm tired of visionless folk. I'm tired of scared folk. If you can't see it, then get out of my way. I know what God's word says. God's word says, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Let me tell you something. You don't need grasshoppers in your house. You don't need grasshoppers in your car. We don't need grasshoppers in the church. You don't need grasshoppers around you because if they can't see what God has for you, then they have no business around you. You'll never get to your promised land if you keep going back to the wilderness and you have grasshopper mentality. You have grasshopper language, grasshopper methodology. Caleb, thank you, Jesus, didn't subscribe to grasshopper mentality. Caleb was not intimidated by the enemy. Caleb knew he was a child of the Most High God. Caleb wasn't a grasshopper. Caleb wasn't claiming the promised land because he wanted it. Caleb was, was claiming the promised land because God had already given it to him. Don't wait till the battle is over. You can go on and shout now because in the end we're going to win. But don't get it twisted. Caleb did not preach a prosperity gospel. 
just name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. No, Caleb knew the power of believing in the promises of God and acting on these promises in deliverance. But the tragedy of the story is simply this, that the majority report of the co committee prevailed. Ten saw barriers. Only two saw blessings. Ten saw giants. Only two saw God. Ten said, the best is behind us. Only two said, the best is yet to come. The negative voices grumbled their way into places to do nothing. And for the next 40 years, you know the story, the Israelites wandered around in the desert doing nothing. Caleb was willing to honor God, but he was outnumbered. And so everyone in that generation, except Caleb and Joshua, died without ever seeing the promised land. Remember, it wasn't the size of Israel's army that kept her back. Because I want to be clear this morning. We may say, oh, we have 60, 70,000 people in the Florida conference, but yet there are 20 million people in the state of Florida. We're not big, we're small. But be clear, it wasn't the size of Israel's army that kept her back. Size is not a qualifying agent for the blessings of God. So it wasn't the size of Israel's army that kept Israel back, but it was the size of Israel's faith. A grasshopper is little. It will always be little. God, however, hasn't called you to be little. And I'm not talking about little in size. I'm talking about little in faith. God hasn't called you to be little in faith. You're a child of God, heir of salvation, purchased of God, born in God's spirits, washed in God's blood. You are a child of the most high God. So you got to act like it. You got to walk like it. You got to talk like it. You got to think like it. You got to vision like it. You got to plan like it. You've got to pray like it. You've got to praise God like it because you're not a grasshopper. Let me tell you something right now. I know who I am. I know I'm a child of the Most High God. And I recognize you've got some folk intimidated. You've got some folk scared. It's not your fault. You're just God's chosen. And favor is not fair. I wish I had a witness in this place. You're just God's blessed. That's why some folk look at you like they do. That's why they people treat you like they do, because you've got them intimidated. But let me give you some advice, what the young people tell me. They say, don't hate the player, hate the game. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? If you knew what I knew, you'd understand why I act like I act. There's a reason God has you here. God's trying to get us to the promised land. And I believe that God wants to use this conference this ministry, this platform to serve as a catalyst to prepare men and women, boys and girls, not just in this state, but around the world, because now we have digital ministry that can reach everybody everywhere, to prepare people for God's soon return. He wants to use this ministry as a model that seeker sensitivity works. That felt need ministry works. That media ministry works. That public evangelism still works. But we're not in Egypt anymore. We can't have Egyptian mentality anymore. We can't do eight track ministry in an internet download society. We must go forward. We must press on, just coming to church, seeing our friends, singing a few hymns, hearing a couple of sermons won't work anymore. Having only conventional ministry won't work anymore, but we've got to press on. We can't play it safe. We can't do what we've always done thinking we're going to get a different result. The definition of that is lunacy, and I'm not talking about changing our message. I'm talking about changing our methods to do effective ministry in our, or in our postmodern world. You see, you'll never see new oceans until you get the courage to lose sight of the shore. We can't rest now. We can't take our feet off the accelerator now. We must go forward. We must press on. If you came to camp meeting today, 
just to hear a superficial sermon, to get your head nodding, just to offer a few amens. You've come to the wrong place today. Florida, I charge you to break loose from worshiping our church history so you can step into your destiny. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the things that God has prepared for them who love him. We're living in a different world today. People are different now. Post-COVID, we are living in a new normal now. People are tired of centralized structures. People are tired of revelation without relevance. People are tired of religion without relationship. People are tired of plastic, phony, lifeless, flat, comatose ministry. People are tired of coming to church to get beat up in the pulpit, to hear about what they have on, to get beat up about what they're not doing. People are tired of seeing the emphasis of policy placed over the needs of people. People are tired of being unable to come to a church where they can share their burdens and problems simply because they're afraid of what other folk might say about them after they come clean. People are tired of poor folk putting on an outside show for an unfriendly world. So Florida, are you going to be like the majority and be like the grasshoppers? Are you going to see yourself as a grasshopper? Or are you going to go and do big things for God? We're living in a time that is distinctively different than anything we've ever seen before. The devil is not playing with us. The spirit of God is being withdrawn from this earth. An unprovoked war, coronavirus, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes. As we speak, wildfires are threatening the Southwest. Death, disease, and destruction are rampant. Gunfire is commonplace. Terrorist attacks are the norm. Gas prices are out of control. Inflation is rising. Businesses are going bankrupt. But I hear the word of God saying, fear thou not. I am still with thee. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Hey, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So Florida, we've got to press on. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in time of trouble. We've got to press on. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We've got to press on. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We've got to press on. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We've got to press on. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. We've got to press on. We are troubled on every side. But we're not distressed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. We've got to press on. It's time to go forward not backward. It's time to take this gospel to the world. It's time to go forward. It's time to use multiple evangelistic methods to win people to Jesus Christ. It's time to go forward. It's time to show the love of Jesus. It's time to go forward. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and I'm not beneath. I'm the lender and I'm not the borrower. I'm going to go forward, not backward, because I've got to press on. A Roman conquistador was different than a Roman soldier. A Roman conquistador wore a blessed breastplate that covered and protected the entire body. The back, the front, the entire body was protected by armory and weaponry that the Roman conquistador wore. But a Roman centurion, on the other hand, wore a breastplate that only protected the chest. The back wasn't protected. Only 
the front. So once you moved forward in battle, you couldn't go backward. You couldn't move around. You couldn't retreat. There was no option of turning back because the back was not protected. And I just want someone in Florida to know today that I'm not a Roman conquistador, that I'm a Roman centurion soldier. I'm not going back. I won't go back. I can't go back. And I can't go back because God's done too much for me. He picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I can't go back, forgetting those things which are behind me. I'm reaching to those things which are before me. I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. I won't go back. I can't go back. I must go forward. I must press on. And you don't have to fear. I don't have to fear because we know how the end is going to be. I grew up in this state. And for those that know me, they know I'm a big sports fan. Miami Heat, I love them. Miami Dolphins, I love them. Miami Marlins, not so much, but I love them. But I'm a big sports fan. And I like watching sports on television. But I travel a lot. As a conference president, as a speaker, I, I travel a lot. And because many sporting events take place when I'm not at home, I have to record them so I can watch them later. Now, when I do get home and I'm able to watch the games, I sit in my chair and I sit in my chair and I watch the games. My wife doesn't sit in that chair. Our daughters don't sit in that chair. But that's my chair and I sit and I watch my recorded games. But unlike most people, I don't start at the beginning of the game, but I fast forward to the end of the game because I want to see who won and I want to see who lost. I'm trying to help somebody. If my team has lost, I stop watching. But if my team has won, I'll keep on going at from the beginning to the end of the game. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, my daughters think this is a strange method. They say, Daddy, why do you go see who won first? That can't be much fun because you already know how the end is going to be. But I love it. And the reason I love it is because no matter how bad things go for my team, no matter how many points they're down, no matter how far they're behind, I don't have to worry because I know the end of the story. And I just came to tell somebody this morning that in life, things may look bad. Things may look tough. Things may get rough. And you may feel like giving up. But the good news is, it doesn't matter how bad things are right now. We know how the end is going to be. Jesus is coming back. The wicked will cease their troubling. The weary will be at rest. I'm trying to stop, but my soul's getting happy right now. There'll be no more dying, no more crying, no more sickness, no more pain, no more cancer, no more coronavirus, no more high blood pressure, no more house note, no more car note, no more stress, no more mess for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah, Christ returning. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, Christ returneth, revive us again. Church, we've got to press on. Forgetting those things which are behind me. 
I'm reaching to those things which are before me. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high call of God in Jesus Christ. God didn't call me to be a grasshopper. God hasn't called you to be a grasshopper. God has not called you to be a victim, but he's called you to be a victor. Don't you forget what God has done for you in your life. Ellen White says, forgetting those things. Ellen White says, we have nothing to fear for the future, lest we forget how God has led us in the past. God has brought us to this point. Somebody should be dead, buried in their grave. Somebody should be strung out somewhere. Someone's marriage should have failed by now. Where your son, where your daughter is right now, they should be in a grave six feet under right now. But God. And if he's helped me with all this back here, as a Roman centurion servant, I must press on up here because I know what the end is going to be. We're going to lose some, bat some battles along the way. But I'm so glad if we just press on, we will win the war. In life, there are ups. In life, there are downs. But you're not a grasshopper. You've got to press on because Jesus is worthy. He's worthy. I'm unworthy. You're unworthy. But Jesus is worthy. And he's worthy of all our praise. He's worthy of all the honor. He's worthy of all the glory. He's worthy. I'm not supposed to be here today. Right now, I, I need to be on some type of probably medication. Cooling my nerves. But I've got to press on. Three weeks ago, Tuesday, I was in Denver, Colorado, scheduled to preach for an event the North American Division was having. At 6.15 a.m., I get a text from my father, who for years pastored in the state of Florida in the Southeastern Conference. And he says, Bud, because it's my nickname, those that know me know I'm Buddy. Bud, I'm praying for you today. May God be with you as you preach today. I love you, Dad. I text him back. And I said, Dad, I love you too. Exactly one hour later, my mother called me, screaming. Hysterical. Buddy, buddy. Your dad is lying on the floor. I, I can't revive him. I don't know what to do. I've called the paramedics. I said, they're on their way. They'll be with you. Just, just hang in there, mom. She's screaming. She's crying. I began to call on the name of Jesus. My dad has no pulse. Three ambulances showed up at my parents' house in Huntsville, Alabama. They rushed him to the hospital. I get on the phone with Delta Airlines because I'm in Denver and I'm like, I got to get to Huntsville because I got to check on my dad. I called Delta Airlines and I don't know what it was, favor. But immediately I called Delta, instead of being put on hold, a customer service agent answers immediately. I 
I said, my dad is sick. I got to get to Huntsville, Alabama. I have points. I have frequent flyer mount. Do whatever you have to do. Get me to Huntsville, Alabama. My cousin, who was at the house at that time with my mother, texts me, calls me. I don't answer because I'm on the phone with Delta and I don't want to lose my place in line. I don't answer. A minute later, my wife calls. I don't answer, but my countenance changes. My wife doesn't get me. She texts me back and she says, buddy, I'm sorry. I text back because I'm on the phone with Delta. Did he die? My wife says yes. Three weeks ago, my dad died. I'm not supposed to be here. But when I tell you I'm glad to see you, that I'm glad this is the day the Lord has made. We must rejoice and be glad in it. That I'm glad to see your smiling faces. It's because it's therapy for me. You thought you came to camp meeting because you thought you needed to hear what the Lord had to say through me. You're at camp meeting. Because God knew I needed you for me. And so all those thoughts have gone through my mind. Doc Machado, if I had not taken the call to be president, and if I had remained at Oakwood as pastor, maybe I would have been able to get to the house in Huntsville soon enough to do something. Because the devil will put all those kind of thoughts in your mind. But then I go to this sermon. God has not called me the grasshopper mentality. That despite life being tough and rough, I've got to press on. And so I don't know what happens during the course of the game of life. But I went to the book of Revelation because I fast forward to the end. And in the end, Jesus wins. And because Jesus wins, we win. Today, I don't know who you are. I don't know what's causing you in life to think you're losing. The death of your father, your wayward daughter, your strung out son, family who don't understand, to that pastor out there who's trying to do something in their church and it just doesn't seem as if the people are trying to work with you. Your finances. I don't know what it is that causes you to think you're losing. God told me to tell you to press on. Because in the end, We're going to win. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet.
God right now, there's a man, there's a woman, there's a boy, there's a girl. There's somebody in the physical space and there's somebody in the digital space. And Lord, it appears as if the devil is trying to attack them with grasshopper mentality. That he's trying to make them seem as if they're a loser and not a winner. But in the name of Jesus, Lord, today they've got to press on. We can't give up the fight. It's too late to give up now. But we got to press on. So, Father, I beg of forgiveness of sin right now. Move in this place right now. Because there's someone who's like me that needs to understand in this battle we're going to win, but we got to press on. So, God, move in this place right now. Forgive me of my sins. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I pause in this prayer. Because there's someone who's standing. There's someone who's listening. There's someone who's watching. And you don't need to come up the ramp, but you need to come beside the ramp today. And I want to pray for you today as we close. And I want to pray for you as we close because today you're saying, Lord, it feels as if I'm losing. It, it feels as if grasshopper mentality is taking over. It feels as if I can't. But in the name of Jesus, I got to press on. Maybe it's a habit you can't break, a sin you can't shake, trouble you can't take. But you're saying today, in the name of Jesus, I've got to press on. And in that pressing on, maybe I need baptism. In that pressing on, maybe I need rebaptism. In that pressing, maybe I just need special prayer. In that pressing, maybe I need to recommit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ at camp meeting here at Calaqua. But whatever it is, you're saying, God, help me press on. Today, if that's you. I want you to meet me right here down on the side of this ramp. Not on the ramp, but on the side. And you're saying, Lord, I want to press on. Baptism, rebaptism, special prayer, rededication of your life. I got to press on. Today, if that's you and you're not afraid, heaven sees, heaven records. And you become vulnerable now. And, and you're saying, I'm coming to the front. I know folk will look at me. I know folk are probably wondering why. But I'm coming because I've got to press on. I can't give up. I know how the end is going to be. So no matter how bad it seems as if I'm down, no matter how bad it seems it might be losing in my life, but I got to press on. I can't give up. We've come too far now. We've been through coronavirus. We've been this, this plague, that pestilence, that trouble, bankruptcy. I've been through divorce. I, I've been through losing a child. I, I've been through having my business go bankrupt. You've been through so much. Your testimony is God. I've been through too much. i got to press on. I brought my children up in this church. I taught them to love Jesus. But for some reason, grasshopper mentality has taken a hold of them. They don't have, want to have anything to do with the church. They don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. But in the end, I want to encourage you, we're going to win, but you got to press on. So today, your child may not be able to come. But you got to come for your child. you got to come for your grandchild. You're going to stand where they're not standing. And in faith, I believe that they're coming. Because he's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. Baptism, rebaptism, rededication, special prayer. He's worthy of it all. And you got to press on. Father, you see your people. You see your people who come to the front. Lord, I've been through my own valley experience the past three months, three weeks. But in Jesus' name, I'm going to press on. I refuse to subscribe to grasshopper mentality. I refuse to forget what you've done for me. Lord, I know how the end is going to be. And so in Jesus' name, we press on. So Father, you see the people who come to the front. You know the cities from whence they've come. You know the communities from which they come. But most importantly, you know the circumstances from which they've come. 
And Lord, I'm asking you right now to give a special blessing to those who've come to the front today. Some have come for baptism, some rebaptism, some for rededication of their life, some for special prayer for themselves, maybe for their children, maybe for their grandchildren, maybe for their finances, but in the name of Jesus, we have all come because we're saying we're going to press on. So hear the cries of your people. Audibly and silently. In Jesus' name, break habits today. In Jesus' name, alleviate addictions today. In Jesus' name, pull down strongholds today. In Jesus' name, I pray that your people, your people who have come to the front today, your people who are watching, your people who are standing, everyone who can hear right now, God, in Jesus' name, may we press on. I don't feel, Lord, anyways tired. God, I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me, Jesus, the road would be easy. But I don't believe that you brought us this far to leave us. So in your name, we press on. Seal the decisions of the people down front right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a hand of praise right now, everybody. As you return to your seats, heaven has recorded you return to your seats. Jesus is worthy of it all. Worthy of all we have to give, we raise our praises to Him. We join heaven as we sing this song. you 
Yeah.